Thank you for the kind introduction and for the wonderful music. <laughs> Good morning. So this talk is for anyone who has been mildly confused about why their colleagues keep listening to them or why people keep wanting to run ideas by them before they make decisions or why their friends keep on suggesting that they go for leadership positions when they're absolutely sure that they've given no sign that that might be something that they're, that they're interested in. It's also for anyone who has someone in their life, maybe a boyfriend, a spouse, a mentee, an employee, who doesn't think that they're as capable as you have seen them be. Go ahead, think about that person you know. That person has been me. Sometimes that person is still me. So this talk comes out of my own utter confusion that people started following me, started linking to me, and generally started listening to me. Suddenly, people st seemed to be subscribing to my proverbial newsletter. <laughs> I didn't even know I had a newsletter. <laughs> so where did these people come from, and why were they following me? All I did was tell my story. All I did was give advice. All I did was make hard decisions for myself. All I did was listen. All I did was apply experience from one setting into a different one. All I did was write an article. All I did was start a hackerspace. So this talk is for anyone who has walked a path like mine. And all I want to do with you all this morning is tell my story, give advice, tell you about some hard decisions that I've made. I'm doing this so that you can take what's useful to you on your own path, and so that you can notice and nurture and guide others as they walk theirs. So, going back about five years ago, I was working as an organic chemist for Big Pharma. I worked in research and development. I created entirely new molecules that we hoped one of them might, through luck and design and hard work, cure or treat a disease someday. But organic chemistry is one of the remaining boys clubs of the larger field of chemistry. And I didn't look like a chemist. I looked around me at my job. I saw some women, most of them on my level with a bachelor's or a master's. I saw fewer with PhDs in management positions. And there was one female director. She was reputed to be difficult to work with or worse. I knew that there had to be other queer people somewhere in the building, but I had no earthly idea who they might be. I looked around me and I didn't see any other ambitious female chemists who rocked a buzz cut, hated chit chat, and regularly went off to visit their girlfriend on the other side of the country. I didn't fit. I didn't see leaders who were like me. But I decided I was not going to end up small. So I watched. I mirrored people around me. I tried to blend in, and it worked in some ways. It didn't in others. I was a good chemist, and that helped. And I looked around me, and some things I tried and things I learned are in ways that sometimes even I didn't notice. I suppressed interest in performing femininity. I stopped apologizing unless I'd actually done something wrong. <laughs> I learned to omit details that showed weakness. 
I learned what I needed to say and what I really didn't. I learned to volunteer quickly for things that I wanted to do so that I wouldn't be voluntold to do women's work. I learned to let that awkward silence of, can anyone take notes, stretch on without saying anything. <laughs> I learned to work independently. I got to where I could be given a target molecule and I would figure out how to synthesize it. I didn't have to be told what to do step by step. And I stayed curious. I learned to ask questions and to not depend on others volunteering information that I would need to know. I had social hiccups. I was an awkward and pedantic child like I'm sure no one else in this room <laughs> has been. And I took people's word for the social rules and I ignored the invisible ones and the ones that I didn't understand. This made things really hard sometimes and I was very confused. It felt like I was running into invisible walls. I was told in my first performance evaluation that I was sometimes coming off as hmm, intimidating and off-putting. But I learned and I looked around me and what I saw was that I could only get so far without a PhD. I didn't like that. I worked with some amazing chemists who only had ma bachelor's or master's degrees. I knew though that if I wanted to change that, I would have to play the game and work, work my way up there so that maybe someday that wouldn't be the case. So I went to grad school. I gained academic skills and knowledge like you do, but those really weren't the most important things that I got out of those years. I kept on noticing and I kept on learning. Seminar speakers were mostly male and when it came time for Q&A, usually only the men in the department would ask questions. I was tired of not hearing female voices, but I also didn't want to slip up and expose ignorance. So I learned to ask good questions. I learned to apply knowledge that I had from one field to another. So when the speaker talked about synthesizing new nanoparticles that might someday be used to diagnose and treat cancer, I noticed the potentially toxic reaction byproducts in the synthesis, and I asked whether they'd considered the question of biocompatibility. Like I said, I didn't want to ask bad questions. Weakness and perceived stupidity were unacceptable, but scientific humility was a value. I learned where the line between those was, and it was a fuzzy line sometimes. I learned how to acceptably show gaps in my knowledge and curiosity. I got really good at projecting a shell of acceptable academic, but there wasn't enough underneath it, there wasn't enough of me in it to make it truly strong and tough. It was strong, sure, but it was brittle. When you hit it hard enough, it was going to shatter and not dent. So, other things that I learned. I started studying martial arts and I learned to take up space, to fall with grace, and to stand up again, unhurt. I began to carry myself differently. I learned these things and I wanted to share them. I found opportunities to mentor undergraduates, lab mates. These were useful skills. 
and through all of this challenging environment, I leaned on the competence in my field that I demonstrated over and over again through my years as a chemist in industry. Competence builds confidence. I rarely doubted myself as a scientist. I had this felt truth to cling to. I could do because I did do. Grad school didn't end well, and it wasn't a smooth journey. I left my first advisor after about nine or 12 months. He was a brilliant, but also emotionally abusive rising star of the department. I joined a group in the chemistry department that was doing interesting research in a field closer, much closer to the one that I had worked in. In that group, if I had stayed and if I had earned my PhD, I would have been the first female PhD student to graduate, to come out of that group in over a decade and possibly over the course of my advisor's career. I learned this about nine months after I joined the group and I decided I was doing all right. I would try to stay. I would try to be that one. But that, that group also had really toxic and harmful ways that that advisor would, inter would interact with the rest of us. I was the golden child, if you will, and I tried to use that status to shield my lab mate from, how could you make a mistake like that? That's so stupid. Just because that abuse wasn't directed at me didn't mean that it didn't hurt me, too. If I hadn't suffered two serious personal losses in one month, I might have tried to hang on for much longer. As it was, I went on medical leave shortly after. The months after that, were the lowest I have ever been. I was incredibly glad that I had left behind the keys to the stock room where we stored the chemicals. So I grieved. As I came to terms with the atmosphere of sexism, the chilly climate, and the abusive dynamics that I'd experienced in graduate school and over the course of my career, I experienced a third searing loss. My career in chemistry and my identity as a successful scientist. I had taught myself how to think how to analyze. I knew how to do that really well. I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know how to recognize feelings. <laughs> I didn't know who I was or what I wanted to do next or what I could do next. All I knew was that I hurt more than I ever had. I kept on mourning. So about two months after I had gone on leave, after I had just started to get bored of looking at the cutest pictures I could find on the internet, <laughs> I got an email. Lee Honeywell, a woman who I had looked up to for years and had met all of twice, asked me if I wanted to start a feminist hacker space. I did. I had time. I had ideas. I could write. I did work, and I volunteered to be president because I had that time, and I had those ideas. 
but I wasn't a leader, surely. <laughs> if anyone was the leader, it was Lee. She wrote these awesome blog posts. She was an Ada Initiative advisor. She'd already started a hackerspace. And she was the charismatic one, not me. But as we worked together, it became clear that in some things, she was following my lead. I was very confused. <laughs> So, so as this project went on, as we started up, as we <clears throat> started talking about it and provided materials and expertise for other similar spaces to start up, by anyone's account, I was a leader. And I still wasn't sure that I agreed, but I sat and I listened and I got the work done. And we needed someone to run our fundraising campaign, so I did. And we raised $11,000 in about 10 days. But, but that's because someone had to do that work. <laughs> and at The Attic, we recognized that planning things and managing social interactions and soothing emotions and making sure that the space ran well all of those were work. But work's not leading, right? <laughs> so, still confused, and I'm still a scientist here. And what do I do with things that confuse me? I take them, and I work the ideas over and over until I can build up a new idea from the components and things that I already know. So the way that I got from that confusion and uncertainty to the way that I understand leadership skills today, I had two turning points for my thinking, both in the last year. The first came when I took your functional and transferable skills inventory um, from the late 70s by Richard Nelson. The way that that worked was I wrote down roles that I had, and I checked them off against a big list of skills categorized variously. So in my role as a chemist, I learned how to handle, you know, I learned how to do detail work. When I did hand work, I also trained my small motor skills in my martial arts. I trained my gross motor skills, so that sort of thing. So I'm going to tell you some of the leadership ones now. And you might recognize some of them in the story that I've told you previously in the work that I've done. The phrase that this inventory repeated was, I can do because I did do. You can't get much harder proof than that. So. Able to move into totally new situations on one's own. Continually searches for more responsibility. Unusual ability to work self-directedly without supervision. Unwillingness to automatically accept the status quo. <laughs> I've never been very good at that. sees a problem and acts immediately to solve it. No fear of taking manageable risks. Able to terminate projects when necessary. So I hadn't just failed at my plans for grad school. I'd practiced leadership skills while I was at it. So I had practiced self-directed work, seeing possibilities, self-motivated learning, ability to distill the important thing, the important concepts and communicate them. I'd trained a perspective that helps change direction when needed. And I had slowly and with difficulty learned a range of social and emotional skills. 
Moving to theory a little bit, there's the concept of self-efficacy, which is how much you think, how capable you think you are. Things that contribute to this are, I've done it. People like me have done it. I feel good about doing it. And other people encourage me to do it. Finally, once I left grad school, once I left that toxic and abusive environment, I had these things. I had opportunity to practice leading. I had a hacker space full of bold women who I could look at and see myself reflected in. I had left the environment that was taking up so much of my mental and emotional energy. And I finally didn't have to fight that to practice things that I wanted to do. I felt good about it. So there are all of these skills, and I had practiced these. Did that make me a leader, a good leader? I was leading, but I was still uncomfortable with this title of leader, although it seemed that I had been practicing leadership-related skills for longer than I knew. But as I thought about this, I also remembered those invisible social walls, those conflicts that seemed to come out of nowhere and take me by surprise. And I felt that something was missing from this mental model. I found that missing piece when I heard Dr. Amy Cuddy speak about leadership, stereotypes, and communication. What I learned from her is that humans associate leadership <clears throat> with the confluence of the quality of competence and the quality of warmth. So stepping back a little bit here, when I talk about leadership and influence, I am not talking about coercion or manipulation. I define influence as the ability to connect with others and discover that their goals are also your goals. These characteristics of warmth and influence are communicated verbally and non-verbally, textually and subtextually. If I talk to you like this, you are going to hear a different speech than if I talk to you like this, or if I talk to you like this. If I ask someone to review a patch, they're going to respond differently if I ask them, could you maybe take a look at this if you, when you have some time? Or, I've submitted this. Please review it when you get a chance. Warmth is a tricky characteristic culturally. It's harder to acquire perceived warmth than perceived competence. And it's easier to lose. And some groups, are stereotyped as low warmth groups. For instance, working women tend to be stereotyped as having high confidence or high competence and low warmth. So some of us are starting from behind. But warmth and influence, warmth and therefore influence, largely come it's been found from authenticity, from presenting yourself and making it clear that this is yourself and not a shell or a front that you're putting on. But authenticity, that's tricky for some of us. Some of us are punished when we try to act authentically. I don't know whether it would have gone better or worse for me if I had actually said um, that I was going to visit my girlfriend. So where does that leave us? 
I had hope because I saw that projecting warmth and authenticity, those were also skills. And if they're skills, we can learn them. We can practice them. And we can get better. So what were the skills behind warmth? So empathy, listening, and not just listening to challenge, listening to hear, listening to understand, lurking well, <laughs> analyzing what you know, learning social skills, learning what the unwritten rules are, which are the actual rules. Your company may not have a dress code, but if all of the employees end up dressing alike, you might have a dress code that no one has bothered to write down. <laughs> Other skills. Learning to notice and respect and encourage the boundaries of those around us. It's really easy to want what we want and just trample right over them. But that's like, that's like stepping over the barrier onto new grass and, and not realizing that you're hurting it until the guard comes to drag you off. We can learn to read those signs and not wait until we have to be pulled off. Other skills. Learning what abusive dynamics look like. Some of us learn this the hard way. But these have been studied. These have been written about. And even those of us who fortunately have not experienced them ourselves can learn to recognize them and learn to name them when we see them. We can break down the purpose of social ritual that we think is pointless. It took me a really long time to learn that the purpose of small talk isn't actually an exchange of observations and ideas. It's a ritual that runs roughly, hello, I observe that you are a person. I am also a person who probably experiences many similar things to you, another person. Perhaps there might be common ground that we could explore further. It's that dance. It's not about a deep discussion of meteorology. <laughs> <laughs> so with all of that, I learned the missing pieces for my leadership were learnable and practicable and transferable skills. And that gives me hope to be better. Learning about the power of warmth and authenticity guided me in knowing what skills I needed to learn and to practice. So, that's me. I'm not the only one who's felt like this, I know that. What about all of you? What about that person you thought about at the beginning? So I'm not just a scientist, I'm a teacher. And part of the way I think about that is helping people make themselves more whole and more capable. I want us to be able to offer each other our leadership and to know how to follow with dignity and with grace. Power doesn't have to be coercive. Leading can be an act of service, an expression of responsibility. When one person carries the big picture, it frees up cognitive resources for the rest of us who just want to work, who just want to practice the bit that we're learning or that we're building. And so the rest of us can focus on the work that we want to be doing. We don't have to do that and also worry about whether that work is pointed in the right direction. When we all learn to lead, we make it so that we can trade that role back and forth. 
that we're not dependent on one person. That one person can burn out or drop out or step back to take care of themselves or get hit by a bus and the community and project can keep on going. The benevolent dictator doesn't need to be for life. I've seen this in the attic. About six months after we started this space, Lee, a charismatic and key founding member, moved to San Francisco, following the siren call of all of the tech jobs down there. And we're still here. We're still going. And because more of us have had to step up to fill that gap, I think we're stronger than ever. We do each other a service when we promote the wholeness needed to lead and lead well. But leadership is learned, and learning requires vulnerability. And vulnerability depends on the safety to be vulnerable. And our communities are demonstrably unsafe. We are artificially limiting our pool of leaders. We create shame around ignorance. We devalue social and emotional skills. We cling to abusive systems and abusive leaders, possibly because they're all that we know. We equate vulnerability with weakness. We privilege competence and freedom over warmth and hospitality. We leave ourselves open to those who consciously perform warmth to manipulate others, to those who try to hack the human UI. We devalue lived experience and natural variation, and in its place we raise up a false and impossible impartiality which ends up hurting us all. We experience incompetent and unethical leadership. And instead of learning to lead better, we devalue the idea of leadership. So, here are some things that I have done and that I have seen done in my communities. I challenge you all to take them up so that you all can say, I can do because I did do. Teach and practice empathy. Read and listen from and learn from those who are very different from you. And when you get that gut knee jerk, but that's just wrong, wait a little bit. Wait a little bit and see whether you can see where they're coming from. Give new leaders the support that they need. Help the show run smoothly and don't try to be the director. Help run operations. Order food. Organize childcare. Figure out where they need to send the press release. Learn to see and to describe the unwritten power structures that you are part of. How does someone become a maintainer on your project, anyway? Find someone else to mentor. It's good for the two of you. When you do that, bring up new leaders and teach them to do the work. Make and follow policies to reduce unconscious favoritism. Differing outcomes from differing groups, it seems, come not so much from conscious discrimination as favoritism, which may not even be known to, to ourselves. Learn to feel, or learn to feel again. First, notice that you are feeling. For some of us, that's not as easy as it sounds. Second, 
Notice what you're feeling. Tools that you can use here are meditation, mindfulness, structured introspection. Make space for other people to have boundaries. Don't make those guards drag you off the grass. Let the new grass grow. Next conference you go to, next meetup you go to, next round of lightning talks you run. Think about that person that I asked you to think about in the beginning, the boyfriend, the spouse, the mentee, the employee. Give them a specific personal invitation. Once they're there, introduce them to others as you see them and not as they see themselves. Do this enough and they might start to believe you and to see themselves as you do see them. My challenge to you is to forget manufacturing false trust, to connect with each other, to invite each other in, to say, you are wanted here. We need you. Your input matters. And we're here to catch you when you need it. My challenge to you is, rise up as you are able. Hold out your arms. See each other. Catch each other. Lift each other up. We can do, and so we will do. Thank you.